Okay, so we are online. All right. Um, tell me a bit about, maybe just as an introduction, um, where you are and what you're doing right now in, in uh, Portugal. Well, at the moment, I'm attending the um, 52nd ESTA conference, which is the International Conference for European String Teachers Association. Um, I was invited to come and present um, my master class on well-being and healing stage fright. It's a big issue for classical music and the whole classical music culture. And uh, it's been really well received and it's been exciting to see um, the results of that in the master class and also um, the uh, appreciation among so many people here for such an important topic. and. Um, yeah, it's something very close to my heart, and I think probably um, everyone's heart, really. So that's that's why I'm here in Portugal, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about what we're doing today. And uh, yeah, over to you, Gregor. Yeah, cool. Ah, that's that's a very interesting topic, and an important one, for sure, for many people. Stage fright is a, is a big issue, yeah. Okay. Um, I will just dive immediately into um, the topic uh, and the questions regarding uh, my master thesis. So the whole thing is about um, how to integrate improvisation into um, modern day teaching on the instrument, be it in single one-on-one -on -one lessons or group lessons, uh, in workshops also. And I'm interviewing um, different uh, musicians that have both experience with improvisation on stage and in teaching it uh, in an instrumental lesson to students, uh, so either in workshops or in single classes. And I'm also researching about uh, what type of uh, modern day technologies can be used in the classroom in uh, making the learning experience for the student better. That could be um, video recordings that teachers make of themselves that they send to the student. That could be the student records a video, um, you analyze it together, you give certain exercises in, in a video format, um, you might send them PDF scores, to work on, um, maybe you use uh, production software like Ableton Live Logic Pro to create backing tracks, maybe something like iReal Pro or Band in a Box. Options are really vast these days and I'm trying to explore what is out there and what can be used in an effective way and what are people already using, what could be used better and I'm just trying to collect as many informations from, from teachers, from musicians uh, in that field as possible. So I'm going to start with a question about improvisation. Why do you think improvisation is important and why should it be taught, in, um, why should it be taught to the student uh, from an early age on? Or are you of like? Is it your opinion that improvisation should be part of the um, part of the instrumental teaching from an early age on for the for the kids who are learning the instrument, or for a beginner, let's say, doesn't doesn't matter the age. Well, <clears throat> I think it's good to get clear about what we're talking about when we say improvisation. Because yes. it means many different things to different people, you know, for, for a, a, a student waiting, you know, in a practice room, not really wanting to practice, maybe they're just doodling around on the piano. For them, that might be improvising. Um, for a serious jazz musician, improvisation is, is a great art form. And, you know, they use it to express their musical ideas and take a solo or accompany someone else in an improvisatory way, you know. Um, <clears throat> so it can seem a bit meaningless to some people, to others it's this very big art form. 
Um, if you asked a, a Japanese uh, shakuhachi player, the Japanese flute, bamboo flute, 400 years ago, they they say that the, the 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 improvisation, the music, is everything that matters to humanity because it's expressing all the meaning of life in every breath. And so you've got all these different pictures of what improvisation is. Yeah. And some people it's free improvisation and they play whatever they want and if they're in a bad mood they play very stormy sounds and angry sounds and if they're in a good mood they play something different so there's all these different ideas and so i'm I'm really um going to mostly talk about my approach because th that's what's meaningful for me and so for me the improvisation i'll get to you question in a minute yes um for me the improvisation is a um a possibility for um making out the equivalent of painting our own pictures just like at school if you had some time in art you would paint pictures you would draw make drawings just your creative ideas and that's exactly what i see um one of the great um benefits and powerful aspects of improvisation and personally that's what I love about it and that's the way I approach it and there's as we discussed there's many different many different um, uh, ways of improvisation and, and ideas and approaches so um, to given that creative context um, I think that answering your question um, I think that improvisation uh, enhances education in every way because the temptation is when people are playing music so in music education where they are learning things by copying what they see a teacher do or by reading and copying from a manuscript um, the focus is often on following an instruction and when we're following an instruction we are often disengaged from the part of us that is creative. And I think that improvisation as a creative process for students, um, any way we can do that and introduce that at any learning level and any age um, where we give students an, op an opportunity to um, participate and bring their own ideas and tell their own stories and to explore and find their own sounds and their own voice. I think that enriches the person's um, experience and and uh, ability to express and tell stories through music. And um, often, obviously, in a younger age, often that is needs to be a much more structured thing. So they might be call and response. There may be all different ways of you know engaging with that. And and um, but as, as students become more mature, they're more able to be self-sufficient in, in their creative work. So it becomes much more like them bringing their own pictures. The younger ones, sometimes it can be more like, let's make a painting together and you put some marks to give it structure and they add their bits. But um, as they get older, so they, there's more potential for the real person to just come forth and create from zero. Yes. So I think this, in this whole process is great for the art form, but in terms of musical development, I think it develops uh, making sound from the inside instead of following a, a, a manuscript or following an instruction. We're, we're, we're taking feelings and we're translating feelings into sound. Whereas when we get a, a score, we have to look at the visual notes and we have to find the feelings that live in that can live in those notes. This is the other way around. We're having the experience of starting with the feelings and then finding the notes that the feelings need. And this does two things. Firstly, it enhances our ability to make the connection between feeling and sound. And secondly, when we've done that ourselves, when we have brought um, a strong relationship between our emotions and feelings and the sound we make when we go to play someone else's music we're much more alert 
and when we hear a, maybe a, a, an unusual interval or maybe an unusual um, chord, we are much more alert to the emotional meaning of that, the emotional intensity and the emotional power of that um, score. So I think it, it enhances our ability to make our own music, but I think it also enhances our ability to um, quickly find the real intentions of a composer if we're playing someone else's work. Yes. Wow, that's, uh, that's really beautifully put. I think it really um, reflects very well as also the, the difference what you described um, between learning a piece that is already written and you try to find the emotions through the notes that are already presented in front of you um, versus the improvisational approach where you first you find you have your emotions and then you try to find ways of putting these emotions into music into translating it into into the notes yeah into the sounds so that's i think very very fitting this uh, this example that you got that you presented there that you explained there yeah thank you yeah, that's it's just how how i experience it yes I wanted to ask you, since um, you were really uh, the person that introduced me to improvisation back then, way uh, many years ago in um, in Sankt Paul, I think it was, right? <laughs> in in Corinthia, I think, uh, in Austria, where you gave these summer workshops, and uh, and with you we had the chance to dive into free um, to so you call it classical improvisation. And I remember you gave us um, stories that we think about um, certain, like, yes, images and uh, that we move in these images, uh, we develop a story, like it could be fictional characters, it could be us, it could be some, some uh, fictional story that we create in our heads and then we tell that story with a certain material of notes that we got from you. I think we also broke three of these um, materials since I back then didn't really understand the different scales and how to use them. So it was just very free, um, but still it was a, a unique experience. I remember for me because it was the first time that I composed basically on the spot by putting different emotions into sound, like playing, like uh, uh, tremolo really angry and then changing from that suddenly to a really fragile um, like easy whatever pattern of notes in in major or I don't remember what I played but I remember that it was very uh, very new and very exciting for me to to dive into this what you described like to dive into my own emotions and to bring them um, forth in the form of of a spontaneous expression on the instrument, uh, spontaneous expression of um, what you carry inside of you, these stories that you want to, that you that are just in your head, but you want to make them orally <laughs> understandable also to the audience. And um, could you could you describe a process? Um, do you still do that with some uh, students in workshops that you give? Or did you change your approach over the years? Mm, I'm just curious um, your your take on how to teach, uh, how to give that experience to people who who never had that, who are just used to maybe their classical musicians uh, used to learn pieces you, by score and then memorize them. And how do you introduce these people to improvisation on their instrument? Well, I think it's the same actually for even young beginners who have no experience on the instrument even, right through to accomplished players who are wanting to transition into some improvisation. And <clears throat> I'll start with the young beginners because, or old beginners for that matter, sometimes you teach adult beginners, hobby players who want to start violin or something. What we're doing is 
helping people to become players who play by listening. They, they're players who listen. And it sounds funny. People think, well, musicians, of course, they're listening. I would say no. Um, they're not always listening to the sound coming out of the instrument. And I think that um, a beginner can do I, every student I start, the young children, seven years old, they can learn to control the bow on each string. As soon as they can do that, we can do tremolo, we can do crescendo, we can do diminuendo, all sorts of things. So easy, but normally only taught later. You know, when you learn a, a bigger work, you start to do the crescendo here and diminuendo here, accent here, tremolo there. Something like string crossing, you know, like in maybe the Mendelssohn concerto in the cadenza part, you know, these arpeggio string crossings. A beginning student can do that on open strings on the first day. It doesn't sound like the Mendelssohn, but it sounds evocative of something. And if they do it fast, or they do it slow, or they do it very strongly, or they do it very gently, they're already starting to experience the wonder of how the sound changes and the sound changing makes them feel something different. And um, for the accomplished musician, I think improvisation uh, taught this way offers a way for them to get away from all the high performance anxiety thinking because nearly every professional musician who starts improvisation feels very nervous because they say, I don't know what to do. And they're scared of making mistakes and they're scared of what their colleagues will think. All of these things come up. It's natural. So being able to just forget about all that and just make some beautiful sounds. And of course, if we're accomplished, we can do more complex um, intervals and such things. But when we're making sound and that sound that's meaningful for us, and so I think that um, I, I, I still teach that way. I still teach it's all about the sound and the feeling. So yes, I can teach as we did um, all the different uh, modes, all the, um, what they call Kirchen Tonleit or something. Yes. I can't remember, but, but all these, these different scales and pentatonic scales and such. Um, On their own, they don't mean anything. They're just notes. You can just play them. A robot can play them. But because we're, we're exploring the realm of music is the realm of feeling. It's not thinking, it's feeling. And it can contain concepts and we, we have to think. Yeah. Excellent things, but the origin is our feelings. And this is why music is so, um, attractive to people to listen to because it puts them in touch with their feelings that they lost contact with. Yes. Like you, maybe you have family or relatives you didn't see for a long time and they out of your mind and you don't know what they're doing and how they're going. That's what our feelings are like. And music puts us back in touch with our self, with our sort of family inside. And so, yes, I still teach, um, to be coming from listening to the sound. And of course, having the story helps us have an emotional framework. Without that, if we're just playing a scale, you know, it could be interesting, but it, it may not necessarily mean much to us emotionally. Yeah. If it doesn't mean much to us emotionally, it's not gonna mean anything to a listener. So having the story, it's like, it's like a, um, a place to hang it up you have a picture, you put the picture up and then you can, you can build, you can build the um, architecture of the music from there. But having a story is the, or even just a feeling, it might be a feeling of sadness or a feeling of beauty or um, wonder, all of these things, they will send you on a completely different path. And so I still teach like this and we still look at, different scales and how they complement that process. So some scales, if we want to create a certain mood, we'll play a scale. It's just, no, 
that doesn't work or try to know that scale. And then we find one that is a nice fit for that story or that mood. Mm -hmm. And the same with tempos and with rhythms and accents. Um, you know, if we want to paint a very tranquil picture, we're not going to be doing very violent tremolo, yeah. stopping and starting and stopping and starting, but we might use that for a special part of a movie soundtrack or something. So all of these, the style, is it something leaning towards, towards Tchaikovsky? Is it something leaning towards, I don't know, John Lee Hooker playing blues down in Memphis, you know, the, the style is, or, or the, you know, the pan flutes, those Amer South American pan flutes with all the different lengths. Yes. So they're all, they're all very different. Emotions, and so being able to choose the different scales and have the different tempos or rhythms and the different styles of play, I think it still stands up because all music um, is made out of that. Whether it's written down or not, all music, you know, in a, on a score, you see it's in six eight. So if if, if it says um, if it says something like uh, Dolce, we know we can't play rough there. We've got to play very beautifully. So we know what key it's in and there'll be some great little key changes and things. So it's all, it's all there in, in all the written music as much. So in a way that approach to improvisation um, that I put forward is simply really, it's the approach all the composers use, but it's just explaining it in, in a way that somebody can come into that world and the doors are open. Yeah. The doors open easily rather than the doors are locked and you have to find someone who has the key two hours later or something. So um, that's, I, I do still teach in that way. Um, but I think it's, you kind of have to meet your audience. You have to meet your, your students um, in an age, way, age appropriate way, also in a way that's experience appropriate, um, and even their personal style of learning and the ways they play and adjust things to make it more successful. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another question, because I I'm I'm not up to date um, how you um, mainly teach nowadays? Do you um, give mainly single lessons, one-on-one uh, -on -one lessons, or do you have group lessons? Do you give mainly workshops? What is your main, um, your main focus uh, regarding to teaching at the moment? Uh, I still am involved very much in both. I have uh, group sessions and I have individual sessions. I think ultimately improvisation can be very successful in a group situation um, for a number of reasons. First is that we can create more layers of sound. So yeah. the solo and violin suite is very different from violin and piano sonata. The, the, the whole landscape of sound that it occupies. Yeah. And ensemble, you know, quartet, small orchestra or a band or something. So you end up with having more, more than one person playing, you end up with um, more possibilities for the color. I think also you, you end up with more possibilities for ideas because everyone comes up with their own way of doing it. And that's really I think a, a powerful part of the education process in improvisation is what your classmate or what your bandmate plays like when, when we improvise together. So if we had a trio, um, maybe we're just painting a kind of background picture and then we each take a solo and while we're taking a solo, the other person, the other people play some kind of background to that. And how they do the background and how we do the solos and how they do the solos and how we do the background it's very rich mm. and so in that way i think the group the group experience um can bring 
are a lot more a lot more ideas and it can give it each person can give each other ideas but they'll probably go home they heard someone do it in the group and they'll go home and they'll try it out and it might become a part of their playing too so yeah. i think in that be very rich um Definitely. Where, where improvisation in groups can be a problem for teachers is uh, where they where they don't have a unified idea and everybody's just chaotically functioning in a different direction. That I don't think that's so successful. But and again, this is why stories are very helpful because everybody knows what the mood is that we're trying to create. Yeah. Nobody would play roughly in something that was meant to be sensitive. No one would play sensitive in something that was meant to be very strong and, and dynamic. So it helps to keep everyone on the same page, as we say. But yeah. um, certainly all of these things can be explored individually. And for some people and in some time on the journey, different times on the journey, the individual time can be very, very um, advantageous because it can be just about what that person needs, not about what all the six people need. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that solo improvisation is a very special place and group improvisation is a very special place and they're not neither of them is better but they both have a different um, treasure to, to offer yeah yeah totally also totally different worlds you can explore in a group and alone yeah. And I think to add to that too, Gregor, is that um, always asking the students what they think, what, they, what stories they would like to do, or what ideas we, we might use, or what scales. So we, we keep it very, um, it's two-way, always two-way, not the teacher just teaching the students a one-way street, you know, on the yeah. barn. It's, it's not very helpful so the more we because we're trying to we're trying to for that person to bring their creative part on their very personal self their very creative self online yeah if we keep sending to them they can't they can't get their messages out so i think it's also important that we create a space which is um receptive for their ideas yeah I just got a, a notification from Zoom that the meeting is ending soon since I don't have the, the paid version of it. Um, would it be okay uh, if I ask you to open, if this session ends, the next session and send it, uh, send the link uh, to my email? I think we can just reuse this one, can't we? Just uh, they, changed, they changed something at Zoom that you can't enter the same link um, before taking a 10 minute break and it oh, okay. To... Yeah, yeah. I have so my email. If you make a new link, then we can immediately start uh, a new session. Okay, great. I'll wait for your link. All right. Yeah, it will. Anyway, it will just shut down and then I will wait for it and open it up on my email. Yeah. I'll try to play. Yeah. I wanted to ask also, do you give, when you, when you give workshops, do you have mixed groups of different um, instruments or do you have mainly is it only violins or is there maybe sometimes also a singer uh, a guitarist uh, a saxophonist you know like uh, do you teach it in mixed groups or on one instrument only and do you have what are your experiences there what changes if the the sound colors are are different and rather than it's all violins or all you know string instruments let's say well there's a number of considerations it's a really good question and it's a it's an area which um can be very interesting or very problematic depending and um i'll tell you about both so when we have um students of very different abilities um it can be if they're all on the same instrument or a similar like a string family instrument it's a little bit easier mm. because the keys that the instruments are in you can usually find 
one key that works d or a or g you know yeah when you start having like a tuba player and a violin player and maybe uh, a singer especially if they're younger and not so experienced they don't know so many they're not able to play in so many different keys and of course as soon as you have brass player like tuba or trombone or trumpet mm. they're not in the open string keys wow. they're not in the easy keys for the violin or the cello so um that that uh is definitely for more elementary players people who are not so developed in their abilities um definitely uh it's much more successful to have instruments of the same or similar family so yeah. if i had almost beginners i would prefer to have string family or brass family together or woodwind not because it's it's too difficult for them to, to play the different keys to and then they feel like they can't really participate and what they do do sounds wrong and so what they do naturally on their instrument the easy notes on the brass they sound wrong with the easy notes on the strings so yeah. somebody got to do the really difficult stuff for the other person to have it easy so in that sense it's good to look at people's ability um and the the types of instruments that they're bringing yeah. um at a more uh, at a more developed level it's fantastic because you start as you said you start to get all these different color possibilities so you can have you know bassoon violin soprano and contrabass and you can make wonderful music that you would never hear with a normal string quartet yes or cello and piano sonata they could never make those sounds so um it's just being i think thinking it through carefully uh how it's going to be with the people that you're working with mm. very important but certainly the the unusual combinations unlock such great potential they open doors and and you know i think this is the exciting thing about improvisation for the concert hall is that we can bring works with all sorts of combinations that you can't go and buy the music for yeah you know, if you wanted to do electric violin and i wanted to do acoustic violin and we had a soprano here in portugal and if we had a, a, a um, maybe a percussionist where do we find a score for that maybe yeah. brazil but not 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 here so it, it means we can bring as performers we can have a very interesting um uh, catalog of music that we can bring and also for concert audiences i think we can make very interesting programs yeah. now um from a from a um so from a from a a playing and and composing music point of view it's very creative and from an audience perspective it's a big plus because they can go and hear stuff now if you're if you've got younger ensembles and you have um so you, if you get a job teaching in a school say we this happens a lot in australia you might get a job at a school of small school a very small music program they may have one violin one piano player one flute player a singer and a and a, someone who plays drums and you're not going to get you're not going to get scored music for that but what you could do is you could give them some ideas for improvisation that could really work putting all of that together yeah you can't go and get the hell leonard scores for that combination but you can create with those students you can create something that really works yes so it's 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 very good educationally like that it's very adaptable this is what yeah. i like about using improvisation in education is it becomes very adaptable yes that's i think that's really in in education that's one of the one of the biggest benefits of of improvis of of using improvisation as bringing a tool of uh, like uh, using it as a way of bringing musicians together that otherwise would never come 
together, yeah? you know, because um, you get the possibility, I don't know, you can play also with a piano, you can play percussive if you like, if you change the the sound by, by putting, um, like by dampening the strings and you can bang on them or you can use a brass instrument to create ambient noises, um, to create an atmosphere. There are so many, so many possibilities to create moods with various types of instruments that make it very, very interesting to, to come together in this, uh, and so to say, to bath in these different uh, sound, uh, sound waves that the, the instruments can create. And very, yeah, very interesting things can come out of that. And, and the best thing is that everybody can express and uh, express themselves and, and open up in also emotionally also to to these sounds and share it's like a group therapy session uh, i think sometimes also to improvise together it's um it's like you you release what's inside of you and you put it in the room and somebody might catch it and make something out of it and throw it back to you in a new uh in a new color <laughs> and and it changes you it um it it enriches everybody involved and it can be a truly healing experience also to to just um, yeah create music in the moment together without without feeling um, yeah restricted by certain rules like oh you can't do that it's not in the scores you played wrong <laughs> you know yeah. and I think there's a couple of other points here that relate to this. Gregor is that um, one is that we, we have extended techniques you were just talking about on the instrument, extended playing techniques, yes, like the, <clears throat> on the brass and woodwind, all sorts of extended sounds and noises, also on strings, on piano, gush, and everything. 